Words at War. Citizens, I'm going to tell you a story. A story of four chaplains of the United States Army. Four chaplains who, in the early hours of a February morning, made a strong and beautiful bid. Chaplain Clark Poling, North. Mm, I'll pass. Chaplain John Washington, East. I'll bid uh, four clubs. Chaplain George Fox, South. I'll pass. Chaplain Alexander Good, West. I'll bid uh, four hearts. Four men, two Protestant ministers, one Jewish rabbi, one Catholic priest. Four men made a bid. And a grateful nation will remember this night, and for all time, that the bid was four hearts. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime, presents another Words at War program. Tonight, it's an adaptation, a portion of Captain Elwood C. Nance's book, Faith of Our Fighters. Our radio story, particularly timely today because of Brotherhood Week, concerns four clergymen. And appropriately, it was written for this series by a clergyman, by Father Timothy Mulvey, who submitted his script under the five-word title, The Bid Was Four Hearts. You were sleeping those cold February nights, citizens. You were sleeping quietly... And while you were sleeping, citizens, the big gray shadows were out on the water. Convoy, they call it. Convoy moving in the night, carrying men and material for the United Nations. Convoy stepping cautiously over gray waters that are treacherous with submarines. Below the deck of the troop transport, Dorchester, four chaplains are sitting in officers' quarters. Then suddenly there's a knock on the door. Is this the chaplain's quarters? Oh, uh, step right in, Jimmy. Oh, boy, it's nice and warm down here. If you ask me, chaplains, this North Atlantic ain't so hot. I'm standing up there on deck looking for submarines, and what do I get? What do you get, Jimmy? I get me nose froze. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, by the way, gentlemen, I'd like you to meet our new orderly. Uh, Jimmy, uh, this is Chaplain Good. How do you do? Glad to know you, Jimmy. And this is Chaplain Fox, and over here, Chaplain Poling. How are you, Jimmy? Glad to know you. Well, yeah, pleased to meet you, uh, oh, uh, by the way, I uh, got the altar all fixed up nice, Father Washington. Uh, what I want to know now is who follows who in the church services. Well, uh, I'm saying Mass at 7 o'clock, Jimmy. I know that, Father. But, uh, well, what I want to know is, does the Jewish service follow you or does the Protestant? Oh, uh, well, perhaps Chaplain Poling might explain it. If you don't mind, Jimmy, you can arrange the altar for Protestant services after, the cha- after Chaplain Washington says Mass. I get you. Is that agreeable to you, Chaplain Good? Perfectly all right with me. I'm holding my service at six. <laughs> if it doesn't make any difference to Chaplain Fox. Oh, I know not at all. Now, let me get this straight. In other words, chaplains, first it's the Jewish service at six o'clock with no cross and the altar turned around, right? Right. Then it's the Catholic service at seven o'clock with the cross and the altar turned around the other way, right? Right. Then it's the Protestant service with, let me see, the altar turned around the other way again, Right. And then, uh, then, uh, you know, chaplains, this would be a heck of a lot easier for me if you would all only get together sometime. (laughs) The convoy moved steadily to the north. And now that they were approaching Greenland, the escort destroyers were beginning to tighten their screening lines. The destroyers were getting nervous now. And a certain skipper was getting nervous, too. The blackest pitch out there tonight, Jackson. Yes, sir. Any other reports? We mean about the submarines? Yes. Oh, no, sir, nothing. But we're running into high seas, sir. Sure we're running into high seas. What did you expect with a wind like that? Let's see the chart. Here you are, sir. Hmm. Getting pretty close to Greenland. Yes, sir. But not close enough to suit me. Well, what do you mean, sir? Right now, Jackson, we're riding deep in Germany's North Atlantic submarine zone. And when you've got a wind like this in your face, a submarine can do funny things. And these were the sounds that night. The large sounds of wind and waves. The small, friendly sounds of lifeboats swinging on the davits. 
and the muffled gray sound of boots keeping vigil on the bridge. And then the night gets very quiet in the North Atlantic. It gets very quiet in the dark cabin. A chaplain has time to lie in his bunk and remember. Chaplain Poling was remembering that night. Oh. <sighs> chaplain Poling. They call me Chaplain. Somehow in this dark room, the memory of that first fear comes back to me now. I remember how you looked at me, Dad, when I, your young minister, opened the door that day. What's the matter, Clark? Dad, I'm... I'm no good. I'm a failure. Well, what's the trouble? A man's dying now, and I... I can't help him. Did you try? Yes, but I... I just couldn't help him. But maybe you tried too much, Clark. What do you mean? I mean, did you give God a chance? Well, I... Now, you go on back, son. Go back to that man, and remember, you're nothing but an instrument in God's hand. I'll never forget that, Dad. Never. An instrument in his hands. That's all you are, Clark Poling. Dear God, help me always to, to be your instrument. And and watch over Corky and Thumper and Dad. Watch over Betty and all of us tonight. Four men in a room had time for remembering that night. And always the memories ran straight to home. A young rabbi was remembering that night. Chaplain Good, they call me. Funny. Lying here in this room, I wonder why. And yet I don't wonder why. I know the reason, I suppose. The reason could go back to a day in French class. I'm thinking of you now, Teresa, my lovely wife. I remember how you looked that first day I spoke to you back at Eastern. We were just kids. Mind if I sit next to you, Miss Flax? Uh, no. I, I forgot my French book. I thought maybe I might look on with someone. Oh, I see. This is the um, second time you forgot your French book, Mr. Good. I know. I, I, I might forget it tomorrow, too. <laughs> Yes, we were very young. But even then, Teresa, I knew I wanted to be near you always. I wanted to be near everything that's good. I wanted to be happy. I guess that's it in a nutshell. Wanting to be happy. Everyone wants to be happy. Everyone. Oh, God, my father, look down on us tonight. Look down on Rosalie and Ruth and Ethel and my wife, Teresa. And God, help us all. Help all men to find ultimate happiness. Yes, there was time for remembering aboard a troop transport. And while men were remembering... The convoy was moving north. Another day came. Another day passed. There was an entertainment. All right, now. All right, all right. Quiet, fellas. All right, quiet. Come on, will you? All right, now. As master of ceremonies, as uh, master of ceremonies, it now gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our next act. But before I do, fellas, me being a master of ceremonies, it's up to me to, you know, tell a little story. Uh, all, right, all right, all right. This happened back in boot camp, fellas. You remember the way Butch Brannigan used to play the piano? Uh, well, Butch knew everything on the piano. There was nothing you could think of that Butch couldn't play. Butch's uh, repertory had everything from jingle bells to shoot the shoibit, Tommy Hoibit. Uh, anyway... 
<laughs> and Butch also used to sing some uh, funny songs. You know what I mean? Well, anyway, he used to sing them until one day the chaplain heard him. And the chaplain didn't like them songs Butch was singing. So he walks up to Butch, who was playing a piano, see? And he says, uh, young man, do you know the Ten Commandments? Butch looked at the chaplain, scratched his head, and said, you got me there, buddy, but if you whistle a couple of bars, I think I'll be able to follow you. <laughs> Those were the sounds that night, citizens. They were happy sounds. And there was silence, too, later. The silence that always returned in the night left a man alone with his remembering. Chaplain Fox was remembering that night. Chaplain Fox, they call me. They weren't too sure of me the first time they saw me. I remember how they looked when they asked me the question. You're a Methodist minister? Yes, sir. Hmm. George Fox, born in Lewiston, Pennsylvania. Hmm. 1900, is it? Yes, sir. Hmm. 1900. Don't you think you're a bit, uh, well, uh, old for army service, sir? Oh, I don't think so, sir. Mm, quite a rigorous life, you know. Yes, I suspect that, sir. I suppose you also know that a chaplain's life will be far different from, uh, <clears throat> shall we say, the congenial surroundings of a parish in Vermont? I quite understand, sir. Hmm. I wonder if you quite understand. Oh, I think I understand war, if that's what you mean. Hmm. <laughs> You do understand war? Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. So many people think they do. Well, I was engaged in active duty with the 2nd Division, World War I, wounded in combat, sir. Oh. Received a Purple Heart. Well. Silver Star. My. A crowd of gear with palms, sir. Yes, with palms. I also have a son who was a Marine in this war, sir. <coughs> yes, of course. Uh... You see, I think I do understand war, sir. Uh, naturally, naturally. <coughs> You laughed when I told you that, Mary Elizabeth. Yes. I'd like to see the sun shining again in Gilman, Vermont, Lord. I'd love to see it again. The sunshine in the hills. Mary Elizabeth and Wyatt. And you, my wife. Yes, it'll be a great day, Lord, when this old fox can come home to all his cubs again. ships were still moving north, and the slow procedure on the high seas was being written in the log. But there were some things that were not written on the log. Jimmy, the chaplain's orderly, was shining candlesticks that afternoon when somebody knocked. Come in. Well, what can I do for you, Sergeant? I uh, was looking for one of the chaplains. The chaplains is busy. What do you want? Well, uh... It's about a letter I wrote to my girlfriend. Your girlfriend? Yeah. Well, for crying out loud, what do you want the chaplains for? Well, it's, uh... uh oh, I get you. Oh, you mean you want a little uh, help, sort of? Yeah, that's right. I, I don't know spelling so good. Well, why didn't you say so in the first place? Here, give me the letter. I'll give it the okay for you, Sergeant. Hey, here you are. I happen to know a little something about this sort of thing. Me being an orderly. Look, uh, don't get that envelope dirty. Okay, take it easy. I'll wipe my hands. You know, Sergeant, being a chaplain's orderly, you get to know how to handle these minor details. In fact, two more weeks hanging around these chaplains, I'll be able to give out with a sermon myself. Okay, where's the letter? Here. And be careful. It took me three hours to do it. Mm. Let me see now. Uh, where is... Uh... On the other page. Oh, here we are. Dear Toots... Toots, Sergeant. Is that her name? Well, that's what I call her. Sergeant, you know Toots is no name for a self-respectful dame. She was baptized, wasn't she? Well, I guess so. Baptism is a sacrament, in case you don't know, Sergeant. Yeah? So call her by her baptismal name, see? Okay. Okay. Now, what is her baptismal name? Marcella. Oh, that's a nice name, Sergeant. And here, I'll write it for you. M A. Uh, uh, just for the fun of it, uh, how would you spell my cellar, Sergeant? You got me. <clears throat> Dear Toots, how are you feeling? I'm fine. I hope you are the same. About getting married when I get back, 
Are you going to marry this dame, Sergeant? You bet I am when I get back. Is she a good girl? Good. You know what I mean? Sure, sure she's good. What do you think? All right, all right. Keep your shirt on. I'm only trying to tell you, Sergeant, that the only kind of a girl worth coming home to is a good girl. The chaplains will tell you the same thing. Yes, the chaplains will tell you. The chaplains told you many things. And in the quiet hours, the chaplain has time to tell himself something. Chaplain Washington, they call me. The altar boys call me Father John. And there was a time when I thought I'd never get quite used to being called Father. And times when I wondered what it meant to be a priest. What has it meant to be a priest? Well, being a priest means many things. It means you, Lord. The eyes and lips and mouth of you. Speaking again those... those words over bread and wine. That's my mass. My priesthood is you, Lord, in the long hours of the confessional. That's the way you wanted it, Lord. Whose sins you shall loose. That's what you said. Well... I have loosed. I have liberated. Oh, my good God. I, a sinner, have lifted my hand in absolution. Yes, it's many things being a priest. It's the babies I've washed clean with your baptism. The boys and girls I've fed with the bread of life. The young men and women I've made one in the lasting bonds of your marriage. It's the weary heads and hands I've touched with the strong oils of your extreme unction. Oh, gentle Christ, thanks for all this. And especially thanks for her. I see your lovely face in this dark room. And I'm remembering a morning long ago in the kitchen. I was trying to break the news to you. John, what seems to be troubling you? Mom, uh, would, uh, would, would it make, make much difference if the... If, uh, I, I mean... <laughs> you mean you want to go away to be a priest? Yes. Sure, and didn't I know it all the while? Well, it'll mean a lot of work and worry for you, Mom. I mean, all the kids at home and and, and everything, and, and, well... John, what greater blessing could I work and worry for than to see you someday? John. I used to dream about seeing a son of mine a priest. I dreamed... Oh, I guess I dreamed it a thousand times or more. Even when you were that small, John. And I was thinking it'd be a great day, John. Sitting there with your father in the front pew. With the candles lit. And the incense floating like a white cloud over your head. With the altar boys in their red cassocks. And the grand organ filling the church. I was thinking that would be the great day when I could look up and say, there he is. There he is. Me own father, John. That's the way you said it, Mom. Oh, God. Look over a little house tonight on South 12th Street. Look over my mother. And all mothers. And you, Mary, my heavenly mother, help me to be a good priest. The convoy moved slowly into the dawn. It moved cautiously all that day against high seas. When night settled down again in the North Atlantic, four chaplains were tired, so they relaxed around a table. 
They said casual things. It's your deal, Pauline. They weren't thinking about the gray waters now. I'll pass, Washington. They were merely looking at cards. I'll bid uh, four clubs. Making small, pleasant calculations. Yeah, I guess I'll pass. And then? Hmm, let me see. Uh, I think I'll bid four hearts. the word stand by. You forget a bridge game. You forget the overturned chair, the sweater you left lying on the edge of your bunk. You forget the hundred details like the letter you were writing and the shoe you were shining. Yes, you may even forget your life jacket. You're just one among hundreds who ran out on a cold deck and you stood there staring out into the dark, waiting. Doesn't look so good, Jackson. No, sir. How many did they say? Well, they just said submarines. There must be a pack of them. Are the gun crews ready? Yes, sir. The men are lined along the deck. Waiting. Yeah, waiting. That's the part I don't like. Uh, what's that, sir? The waiting. It's like being in a dark room. You don't know whether you're going to be hit in the head or the ribs. Well, the bearing is 035, sir. It looks like the ribs, perhaps. That could be any angle. In a wind like this, those subs could patrol us for 48 hours and call the shot at any angle. What's our position? We're out of line, sir. I thought so. What are we making? Three knots, sir. Roughly. Three knots. Running out of formation at three knots. You know what this means, Jackson? I'm afraid I do, sir. The Dorchester's going to be easy pickings if any sub decides to operate tonight. So you waited like a man in a dark room. You kept staring out over the rail into the dark. You couldn't believe that out there under those wild, cold waters... Men were waiting for you, timing you, measuring you. You waited an hour. You waited two hours. And then gradually you relaxed. You breathed again. You were normal again. After all, someone could be mistaken. Could be a false alarm. You took one more look over the rail. Then you walked slowly back to the stateroom. Watched some of the fellows for a minute. Walked over to your bunk. Sat down. And your fingers through your hair. Searched for a cigarette. Found it. Lit it. Lay back on your bunk. Yes, yeah, probably was a false alarm. bubbling, murderous fish. It was coming. Stand by! Like a tiger shark, it had spotted you. Here it comes. Here it comes. All right, citizens. Let it be said quietly. Let it be said without the noise and confusion of men jumping over the side of a stricken ship. Let it be said without the shouting of boys as they watched the cold sea coming up to meet them in the dark. Let us say only the Dorchester was gaping with a wound from which she would never heal. Right now it's getting more quiet. The lifeboats are pulling slowly away. The Dorchester is settling slowly. Four chaplains strapped in their life jackets are standing on the deck of that stricken ship. Are you okay, Holy? Fine, Washington. How about you, Rabbi? So far, so good. And you, Fox? I'm all right. Well, she's uh, she's going fast. All the lifeboats are gone. We got most of the fellows over the side. Hey, wait a minute. Uh, look at this kid. I can't die. I can't die. Take it easy, son. Where's your life jacket? I lost it. I can't die, Chaplin. I can't. He lost his life jacket. Look, over there. Three more kids without their life jackets. Son, listen, son. Pay attention to me. Yes, sir. Can you swim, son? No, sir. None of us can swim, sir. We're afraid, sir. We're afraid to go over the side. I see. And no life jackets. Well, chaplains? Yes. You're right. Of course. It's the only way. I'll take this lad, father. You and Paul, this boy's mine. Yes, son. Quickly. Stand up. Stand up straight. All right, lad. Yes, sir. Raise your arms. Okay. No, no, higher, higher. <laughs> You're going to be all right. You've got to be all right. My 
My name is Fred Pinkler, quartermaster on board the Dorchester. My address is 526 Pennsylvania Avenue, Brooklyn, New York. My name is John Mahoney, United States Coast Guard Reserve. My name is O'Keefe, merchant seaman. We saw it, all of us. We saw the four chaplains give their own life jackets to men that didn't have any. And when our lifeboat drifted away, we saw the chaplains kneeling together on the slanting deck. They were kneeling like that when the ship went down. Yes, the bed was four hearts. It was the complete, the ultimate bed a man can make. The bed was four human hearts. What will be our bed tonight, citizens? Will we be honest with ourselves for one moment this night? Will we search our individual hearts and come up with the beautiful answer? The answer we know is right. Will we sit at the broad table of this, our beloved land, and play the game according to the rules of him who is the eternal God and father of all mankind? What say you, player on the north? What say you, player on the south? What say you, players on the east and west? Will we look tonight into the eyes of our fellow man, whoever he may be, and bid a portion of old pride or stale prejudice or ancient hate? Or will we remember that night of February 3rd, 1943, when a ship went down 90 miles south of Greenland? Will we remember that moment when the ship was poised for the final plunge? That moment when the miracle of man's love for his fellow man converted her slippery deck once and forever into a great altar from which four men offered their gallant souls to God? Will we? Tonight on Words at War, we've brought you a portion of Captain Elwood C. Nance's book, Faith of Our Fighters. The radio dramatization was by Father Timothy Mulvey. The four chaplains were James Monks, Chaplain Washington, Carl Emery, Chaplain Poling, Ted Jewett, Chaplain Fox, and Martin Blaine was Chaplain Good. Our narrator was Lamont Johnson. The music was arranged and played by William Meter, and the production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. Next week, Words at War will present the radio dramatization of the Stalin Prize novel, The Rainbow, by Wanda Vasilevska. This series of programs is brought to you in cooperation with the Council on Books and Wartime by the National Broadcasting Company and the independent radio stations associated with the NBC network. Music